Maybe this, this one's louder. Hello? <clears throat> Much better. Much better. Check. Okay. All right. Now we're back. Ah. <laughs> Gotta love technology. All right. All right. I'm going to give you the countdown. All I'll right. hit that uh, just as I say go, you can go. So in three, two, one, go. You have 30 minutes. Okay. I need my PowerPoint up on the screen, please. Uh, for my opening statements, first of all, I want to express my respect and appreciation for Dr. Syngenis. I uh, got a chance to do lunch with him this afternoon and get to know him a little bit, and uh, he's been on my radio show, and I really enjoyed uh, spending some time with him. Unlike the vast majority of our detractors, Dr. Syngenis has at least taken a significant amount of time to hear our side of the story. I mean, you can't write a book that's well over 700 pages long without making at least some effort to understand the content that you're writing about. So even though we disagree, I respect him for doing what very few others have done. Furthermore, considering this topic, obviously I've got the home court advantage, as, <laughs> as it were, here with this audience. Uh, the audience may be in my favor. However, debate is Dr. Syngenis' game. Uh, I know because in preparation for this evening, I've spent well over 20 hours of my time watching him debate. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the ones that he did with uh, Dr. James White, although I will say I watched him in double speed, so I've gotten used to hearing him in chimp buck mode. <laughs> You're kind of like speaking in slow motion now. <laughs> um, and in the course of watching that, I can see, you know, honestly, he's the first Catholic I have ever known, and I've known a lot of Catholics, who is as well-versed in the scriptures as he is. In fact, I've never even known a Catholic priest to be as well-versed in the scriptures as he is. So again, he has my respect in that regard. I don't know any either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can believe that. Um, as I understand, he's done something like 30 debates in his life over the course of the past few decades, and I can see he is quite skilled in the art of rhetoric. Whereas, look, I'm an artist, I'm a filmmaker by trade. Uh, yes, I've spent my entire life studying the scriptures, but uh, debate is not my sport, nor do I have any real practice or passion for it. So, in fact, I think this is the first time I've ever done a real structured and timed debate. So I kind of feel like Rocky going up against Apollo Creed in the first movie. Although we know how that turned out, so <laughs> there may be some hope there. <laughs> But needless to say, I, I will not be underestimating his ability to wage, or at least attempt to wage, a convincing argument this evening. Uh, and while since brevity has not been my strong point, and this is time, I better shut up <laughs> and get moving here. Uh, understanding the scriptures, should we take the Bible literally, figuratively, allegorically, or as poetry? Well, it is my position that the Bible tells us when it is using one of those things. Allegory, metaphor, behold, you know, a parable. Oh, okay, we're talking about parable. Uh, the heavens are stretched out like a tent, or as a tent, oh, okay, simile. Hey, John, you know that weird freaky beast you just saw? Here's what it represents, oh, okay, symbol. Otherwise, I believe the default is to take the Bible literally. I believe scripture is divinely inspired, thus we have no authority to interpret it in any other way apart from that in which the authors were originally inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. I believe scripture interprets itself through internal witnesses, and that scripture trumps all contrary ideas of of theologians, formerly pagan church fathers, popes, priests, creationists, and modern PhDs. So, with that, taking scripture at face value, on page 258 of Dr. Syngenis' book, Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, he says, if biblical inspiration is true, and given its full weight in the discussion, we have little choice in understanding Genesis, but to accept it as the actual reality of how God created the cosmos wherein each word and each phrase is a truth unto itself about the cosmos, as well as being intricately connected to the other detailed truths. On this, we agree. So let's dive in. I'm going to start by talking about the firmament because the Bible starts, starts off that way. I will be arguing in favor of this model right here. Many of you have probably seen this graphic. This was created by the scholars at Logos Bible Software. Now, while they may not agree with this themselves, they may not believe this themselves, I believe that they are being at least intellectually honest with the text in this depiction. And so I will be arguing in favor of this. Uh, but before I do, I want to hear a few words from Dr. Syngenis himself regarding the issue of the firmament from a video he posted online promoting his book. And I need to hear this. Volume, please. I believe that dome is a hard dome and it's the firmament. 
Now, is that true or false? Okay, yes or no. There's really no in-between to that. Now, there's something vastly different between a firmament and an expanse. A firmament is something firm, and the, and the flat earthers will say, well, the dome is firm, and that's where the word firmament comes from, some, something hard, okay? Um, and these other translations are translated as expanse. That's just talking about space, you see? The expanse of space is uh, the firmament. This is a difficult issue to deal with. What is the firmament? Do we actually have a dome over us and uh, a hard dome? Because the word uh, rakia in Hebrew does have a connotation of being hard. Uh, so th this is a whole big issue because if there's a dome, uh, well, yeah, then the earth has to be flat. There's really no other way to look at it. Indeed, I would agree with that. Now, that was obviously an edited version of what he said. You can watch the full version. I didn't take anything out of context. He believes and will argue, I'm sure, in favor of firmament in the terms of the expanse. But he acknowledges what the words actually mean. So we'll look in the scriptures. And as you look in Genesis 1, it shows up beginning in verse 6. I've underlined a few words there to show that there's only one of these things. A firmament, the firmament, it. There is one structure called the firmament. As Dr. Sinjenis pointed out in that clip that comes from the Hebrew word rakia, rakia, Strong's number 7549. You can look up in virtually any online concordance. It'll tell you this thing is solid. It's expanse as if beaten out. It is a solid structure for momentum in Latin, stereoma in Greek. Uh, it is a base support supporting God's throne above, regarded by the Hebrews as solid supporting the waters above also. That's in Brown Drivers Briggs. You can look on other resources like Bible, Blue Letter Bible and see the same definition there. You'll see that it comes from a root word, raka, which means to beat, stamp out, beat out, spread out, stretch, to beat, stamp out, you know, overlay like plating metal and so forth. And so I say, okay, here's the word rakia, comes from the word raka, which means to beat out. How do you beat out air? How do you beat out gas, clouds, and the vacuum of space? Well, uh, on page 285 of his book, Dr. Sinjetis, Genis, uh addresses this issue. He says, the problem here is that Skiba is confusing the result with the cause. Although it is certainly true that rakia and its root raka ha refer to a solid substance and something beaten out and spread out respectively, Skiba neglects to see that the firmament is the result of a solid substance being beaten down and spread out, which result allows the firmament to retain a solid quality, but also obtain another quality, one perhaps that it didn't have before it was beaten out. Scripture insists that this second quality is its flexibility and ethereal form since the birds must be able to fly in it and the sun, moon, and stars to move in it. Hence, Skiba's questions, how do you beat out air and how do you beat out the vacuum of space, are misplaced. Since space, both inner and outer, is the result of God beating out the firmament so that the celestial bodies could be placed in it on the fourth day. Hence, one can't beat down the vacuum of space because it has already been beaten down to its finest, the most discreet level that nature will allow. Well, I will let the audience decide whether Dr. Sengenis' position has any merit or whether we should admire such an impressive display of mental gymnastics. As for me, it is clear that the thing is still quite solid. You can look at the Hebrew word itself, which I showed you, and when the Hebrew scholars translated their Bible into Greek, they chose the word stereoma, which once again conveys solidity, strong support. Uh, we also have internal confirming witnesses to this within the scriptures. We see in Job 37, 18, there's multiple translations, hopefully you guys can see all that on the screen there, talking about can you spread out the skies hard as a, or like cast metal as a molten looking glass? Uh, now, it seems to me he's got the cause and effect sort of thing reversed. It seems when I read this, that the, the challenges are, can you do like God did, take the vaporous dust and beat it out into a solid structure? Can you do that? You know, think about how man was created from dust. This solid structure right here came from this dust of the earth, right? I believe that's essentially what's being said here. Can you take this vaporous structure and beat it down into a solid uh, fixture? And we also see in Proverbs 8.28 the same thing, that he made firm the skies above. So why does the structure need to be hard, firm? Why does it need to be a solid structure? Well, its original function, we see, is that it separates the waters from the waters. 
We see that in Genesis 1, 6, and 7. And it's also uh, reiterated by David in Psalm 148, quite some time after the flood of Noah, that there are waters still up there, the waters that be above the heavens. It also supports God's throne above the earth. We see that in Ezekiel 1, 26, also implied in Ezekiel, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 66, 1. And then we come to Amos 9, 6, the one who built his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome. The word there is aguda, a structure fitted together over the earth. And if you look that word up, you'll see that it's Strong's number 92, and it is the vault of the heavens, the vaulted dome. You can look at that verse up in multiple translations, and for the most part, they're all saying the same thing. Now, King James uses the word troop. Why? Well, a troop is a tightly knit unit of men. The word conveys something that is tightly knit or bound together. I was in C Troop first of the 110th Air Cav when I was in the Army, a tightly knit unit of men. But you can look at various translations, and they're all pretty much saying the same thing. Vault, vaulted dome, etc. You see those translations right there. Here's some more in the English language. You can see there. You can even use websites like BibleHub.com and go to Google Translate and see what foreign languages did with it. For instance, the Afrikaans, Amos 9.6, translates, the one who builds his soldiers in the heavens and settled his dome over the earth. We see the Albanians say, is he who builds the, up the chambers in the heavens and places the foundations of his heavenly cup on the earth. We see the Chinese says that that is to build a building in the heavens to settle the heavens on the earth. So the heavens are attached to the earth and pour out the sea water on the earth. Yahuwah is his name. The Koreans say basically the same thing. Build the temple in heaven, laid the foundations of it on the earth. And the Russians, same thing. Build the upper palaces in the heavens and set up his vault on the earth. So the multiple translations are, are confirming that idea. We see in scripture the simile, right? That the heavens are stretched out as a tent or like a tent. Well. It would, you know, if you're going to use a simile, you're going to engage in metaphor, it would help to at least say something that would convey in the mind of the listener something remotely similar to what you're talking about. So in the case of, I, of Isaiah here, saying that the heavens are stretched out like a tent or as a tent, you got to know that this is the understanding that his audience had and that he, of course, would have had writing it. Something like that, a Bedouin tent or perhaps a yurt or perhaps in more modern times, a dome tent. Now, various people argue whether or not <clears throat> excuse me, Enoch should be considered scripture. I'm not going to go there. That's a topic for a whole other debate. There are various people, including church fathers, who actually refer to it as scripture. It's interesting that it tells you point blank in chapter 89 that it, the, the heaven is described with having a lofty roof and that the waters of the flood would come and fill up that enclosure. The word uh, enclosure there is used about five times in that one chapter, talking about basically a Truman-style enclosed world structure that was flooded uh, at the time of Noah. So for me, uh, the, the firmament truly was the key in, in my conversion, if you will, to the, on this topic. It's what seals the deal in more ways than one. Unquestionably, the thing is hard, according to the text you see there. Firm, according to the text you see there. Supporting the waters above, attached to the earth, within which Yahuwah placed the sun, moon, and stars, and upon which his throne sits. Clearly, this is a very important issue to Yahuwah. The only model, in my opinion, that accommodates every aspect of the firmament is the circular enclosed world model. The only way around this is to grossly misrepresent the scriptures, yanking the true meanings of the words out of context and fantasizing about definitions for those words which are not even remotely supported by the text or the historical context in which the scriptures were written. So let's move on to the circle of the earth. Well, when you get to the third day, we see that the dry land appeared. How did the dry land appear? Well, we go through other texts, like Job 38, for instance, and we see that he's laying foundations. And he even asks the question, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And he never answers the question. So when I show people the model of the terrarium, they say, well, what's that thing sitting on? Well, God never answered that. That's part of why he's God. He's like, declare if you know, <laughs> meaning you don't know, right? So he's laid this foundation on something we don't know. He never gave us the answer. He put the earth on pillars, we see in 1 Samuel 2. We see the foundations there in Psalm 102, and we finally get to Psalm, uh, excuse me, Proverbs 8.27, where we see that he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. Now, King James says he set a compass on the face of the deep. That's a little weird. What's he talking about? This? Is this what he means? A nice face on the deep? You know, throw a compass on there? <laughs> What's up with that? 
No, I think the translators of the ESV just helped us out using a better translation, in my opinion, of the Hebrew that was actually used there. It says he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. We get the same type of thing in Job 26, compass the waters with bounds, ESV inscribed a circle on the face of the waters. This is the context in which Isaiah wrote the circle of the earth. He's writing long after those guys. So he would have had that context in mind when he wrote that. And of course, the word used there in the King James as set, the other translations say inscribed, is kalkak. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Forgive me if I butchered it. Strong's number 2710, which is to inscribe a decree, like to chisel in stone, engraved into something. You carve into something. What happens to water when there's no heat? It's frozen, right? Well, we see in Job 38, yep, the waters became hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. That, I believe, is what's going on here. The face of the deep had a in circle inscribed in it. Question, how do you inscribe a ball into the face of space? Doesn't seem to work. Of course, the word circle that is used there, the Hebrew word chug. Now, in his book, Dr. Syngenis, uh, essentially attempts to discredit my work by saying that I have no formal training in Hebrew and Greek, which is sort of true. I do have some courses under my belt, but uh, I will go ahead and allow a couple people who do have such credentials to say the same things I've been saying all along. For instance, Dr. Robert Schneider writes, <clears throat> while the writers, typically creationists, assert that the Hebrew chug, I shall use chug, of Isaiah 40.22 means sphericity, they provide no lexicological support. They also assume that Job 26.7 refers to empty space. That is the modern concept of physical astronomical space. Some proponents are primarily concerned with refuting the canard that the Bible teaches a flat earth. St. Jerome 340 to 420, the early Latin church's master linguist and Bible translator, in his commentary on Isaiah, Jerome, who is regarded by critics today as a competent and careful scholar, specifically rejected the notion that in this verse the prophet is referring to a spherical earth. So he was being intellectually honest with the word that was being used there, even though it is my understanding, and I'm sure Dr. Sanjitis may bring this up, that he advocated a spherical earth himself. He was still being honest with the word that was being used there. <clears throat> the preponderance of philological evidence and the translations of ancient scholars and modern ex experts alike provide overwhelming testimony that Isaiah 40.22 does not refer to a spherical earth. There is simply no warrant for Eastman, Sarfati, and Morris to declare, contrary to its plain sense and in violation of its semantic domain, that chug literally means sphericity. They have read the earth's sphericity into the text, not out of it. One should not read meanings into biblical texts that are not there in order to make them conform to modern scientific knowledge. Another guy, Dr. Dennis Brat Bratcher, says the Hebrew word that is used in Isaiah 40:22, chug, does not at all imply a spherical earth. The root word only occurs in the Hebrew Bible as a verb in nominal forms. The same root occurs four times, three as the noun, and once as the other noun that you see on the screen there. This term refers to a circle instrument, the last one, a device used to make a circle, what we call a compass, and that's what we see in Isaiah 44:13 in the verse that he has there. Dr. Bratcher continues, people of the ancient Near East, as well as the ancient Hebrews and Israelites, conceptualized the world as a large, flat, circular disk anchored in water below. By pillars or foundations, between the earth is this deep, this deep was Sheol, the place of the dead. The earth was covered by a firmament, conceived as a large, solid, upside-down bowl or dome, in which the stars were placed. Upon, above the dome, was also water, which was the source of rain. The dome had doors and windows to let the waters above fall to the earth. God was described as ruling the world from his throne above the dome. These references are not just isolated anomalies amidst an otherwise scientific grasp of the world. These conceptions are pervasive throughout the biblical narratives, not only in describing the physical world, but extended into the metaphorical and app applications related to excuse me, relating to other topics or even simply as ways to talk about God uh, the world and God. Now there's another scholar people love to run to whenever they don't like what I'm saying. Dr. Michael Heiser, what do you say? Well, he's a self-professed Semitic language expert and Dr. Michael Heiser has a whole presentation essentially saying the same thing I said. You can check out the video Flat Earth, a Doctor and the Village Idiot, of course me being the Village Idiot. 
So if you are the type of person who cares about academic credentials, well, there you go. If that's what you need to believe, they're saying the same thing I'm saying. There are plenty of others like them who are at least say, being intellectually honest with the text. Whether they actually believe it or not, that's another issue. As for me, you know, the uneducated village idiot, personally, I think Proverbs 8 sums it up quite well. There's a parallel Bible right here. I'll read from the uh, Amplified Bible as a summary of this creation. <clears throat> when he established the heavens, I, wisdom, was there. When he drew a circle upon the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the foundation, fountains and springs of the deep became fixed and strong, when he set for the sea its boundary so that the waters would not transgress the boundary set by his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. And if you really want to go deeper, uh, go back and read Job 38 and compare it with Genesis 1 for a really detailed analysis. The final point that I will be addressing here in my opening statements is whether it's a heliocentric or geocentric model. Now, on this, we agree, at least sort of. I'm sure he has a different take on how the geocentricity works. Um, but, you know, at least we agree that there are almost 70 scriptures, at least, that describe the movement of the, the heavenly luminaries, the sun, moon, and stars. Zero in reference to movement of the earth. Now, Dr. Simgenis has done some magnificent work in this regard, and I actually highly recommend you check out his presentation on geocentrism that he did in Dallas back in 2015. You can watch that on YouTube. Uh, I'm a little bit frustrated by it, though, because if he would only take the exact same approach and attitude toward the scriptures that he does in the first 15 minutes of that presentation, uh, he'd already be on our side. <laughs> uh, sadly, he doesn't, so while his opening dialogue sounds very admirable in terms of taking a stand for scripture, in my opinion, he just doesn't go far enough. When you look at the scriptures, you see uh, lots of scriptures. Uh, here's just a few talking about the earth is set on pillars, that it's not moving, it's stationary, and it's not going to be moved. Uh, a famous one, interestingly enough, on Werner von Braun's tombstone, referenced there, uh, Psalm 19, declaring the firmament as you know, his handiwork, it declares his handiwork. Now, go down to verse 4, and you note that he has set a tabernacle for the sun, a structure for the sun. A tabernacle, in that case, would have been like uh, the tent in the wilderness that the Hebrews had. The sun is described as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. So it's the sun that's in motion. His going forth is from the end of heaven, interesting, and his circuit unto the ends of it. Now, look at that right there that I have highlighted, uh, <clears throat> or verse 6. This works well for a finite enclosed system. I'm not really sure how Dr. Syngenis can make that description work in a heaven that supposedly extends for billions of so-called light years away from the sun in all directions. Uh, are we still taking the Bible literally when we look at the description of the stars? We see Isaiah talking about the hosts of heaven. The hosts of heaven are, is a phrase that is used interchangeably for the armies of heaven, the hosts of heaven, sentient beings, as well as the constellations. I believe they're one and the same. I believe scripture uh, testifies to the stars being angels a number of places. We have some, uh, a perfect example in Revelation 9.1. It says, behold, I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. The book of Enoch tells you point blank that the stars are sentient beings. Whatever the case may be, Isaiah says all the hosts of heaven shall fall down. How are they going to fall down? He uses a simile here. As a leaf falleth from the vine and as a fig falls from the tree. Question, how does a leaf fall from the vine and how does a fig fall from the tree? Where does it fall to? It falls to the earth. We see Yeshua or Jesus, if you prefer, saying the same thing. The stars of heaven shall fall in Mark 13, 25. Peter talks about this event, saying the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise. And John says in Revelation 6, 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Okay? That he's telling you where the stars are falling to. And he even uses the same essential metaphor right here, or simile, as a fig tree casts her untimely figs. So, if you believe in the Star Trek, Carl Sagan, Star Wars idea of the cosmos, with this being a galaxy and all those points of light being stars, which are allegedly suns with planets going around them, and that there are trillions of stars within a galaxy and trillions of galaxies out there. Yeah, okay, are you really going to take the Bible literally at this point? You know, all the stars are falling to Earth. Okay, so I always say, look, forget about the Antichrist and terrorism. We got bigger problems if Beetlejuice is headed our way, followed by Octorus and, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> Andromeda. So, you know, at this point, I, I'm looking at the scriptures and I'm looking at what science and what they're trying to teach us, and somebody's lying to us. And personally, I'm not prepared to say that it's Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, and John, all right? Somebody's lying to us. I do not believe the cosmos, according to the scriptures, can be what we're being taught by mainstream science. So, to summarize my opening statements here, I believe from Genesis to Revelation, the earth is consistently described by Holy Spirit-inspired authors as fixed and not moving, spinning, orbiting, etc. Circular with edges, corners, pillars, foundations, etc. Under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four. And I showed you this model in my earlier presentation, and I simply say, which is a better fit for a stationary world set on a firm foundation of pillars, under a dome, within which the sun, moon, and stars move, and which will accommodate all the stars falling to earth. I submit to you that Yahuwah's footstool is the much better model than what he's going to present. I yield my time. Thank you. Okay, Rob. Thank you much. So, what's that? You, yeah. There you go. All right, let me uh, stop on this and let me start this over. All right, Robert, when I give you the countdown, you'll have 30 minutes. In three, two, one, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Rob. That was uh, very insightful. And uh, I think you've given us a lot of information to chew on, and I will try my best to um, sort it out and get to the truth of the matter. Um, I think at this point uh, it is uh, a good thing to say that, and Rob may agree with this, that Bible interpretation is not easy. Um, I've been doing it for 45 years, and um, I can tell you that um, it's not the Bible so much as it is, well, the Bible is, it is partly the Bible's fault because the Bible is written, as St. Peter says, sometimes in very difficult ways for us to contemplate and understand. In other passages, it's easy, easier, I should say. Um, but the Bible is a, a book that's um, quite complicated, quite complex. Uh, especially in the fact that it's written over 1,500 years by many, many different authors with many, many different styles and many, many different cultures. Um, so you add all those things together, shake them up, and you come out with a book that on one level, it's, it's easy to understand. On another level, it's, it's very hard. So I'm getting a little feedback here. Are we okay? So, uh, but I want to uh, agree with Rob that um, I have learned and the Catholic Church teaches that the Bible is to be interpreted literally unless it's impossible to do so. So on that basis, we're on the same footing. We come to the Bible and we expect that God's going to speak to us in a way that we understand and unless the Bible is indicating to us that it wants to speak in a different way than literal, usually it will give us signs that it's the case. Sometimes it doesn't, um, but usually it will. And so now we know we have to switch gears, you see. But at least I think we can agree that we're working with literal Bible interpretation. That doesn't make it any easier, however, <laughs> okay? Because the Bible says, it may say 12 things that are literal, and then it's the exegete's job to get them all together and try to figure out, of those 12, which all seem to be saying the same thing, uh, what's really being said in the end, in the, in the conclusion of the whole thing. So um, I just want to, you know, each one of us has to be humbled when we sit before the Word of God because it's, it's from the infinite mind of God. But... Having said that, then we got to get into what does the Bible say, literally. 
So uh, I'm, I'm going to try to make this relatively short uh, because I only want to cover a couple of things. I mean, I wrote a 750-page book here that you can pick up at Flat Earth flatwrong.com, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and uh, see what else we have to say about this. But I'm just going to pick a couple of things out of this. So let's, um, here's the first thing that's an interesting little fact. In the Hebrew language, there is no word for sphere. <laughs> Here we are having a debate on whether the earth is flat or a sphere. And yet, the Hebrew language had no word for sphere. Isn't that interesting? No word for globe, no word for sphere. And by the way, it didn't have any word for a flat disk either. Okay? So we're already starting off with, you know, a handicap. So now we have to deduce from the Bible if it actually addresses this issue in a concrete, literal fashion that we can walk away from the Bible and say, yep. The Bible says the earth is this, okay? It doesn't do that for us. We have to walk our way through the Bible and deduce from the Bible what it's trying to say to us. And I will do that right now, I believe. First of all, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, and I'm sorry I didn't bring my computer. Um, when I debate, I just debate uh, off the cuff like this and, and from my notes and it makes it a lot easier for me and you, I believe. Anyway, so Isaiah 40, uh, verse 22 is one of our main verses. It says this, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Okay, so the operative word here is he sits above the circle of the earth. So we're going to have to zero in on this word circle, okay? And as Rob had said, that comes from the Hebrew word chuk. And I said it just like a Jew would say it, chuk. <laughs> but, but, but as we go on, I'm just going to say kuk. So instead, you don't have to listen to my guttural here. It's the word kuk. So that, that's an interesting word. But then there's other stuff in this verse that is also interesting. It says he looks at the inhabitants like grasshoppers. Well, why did he put that in there? You know, there may be a lot of reasons why, but one of the reasons I think is the fact that he wanted to show us how far above us God is if we were to localize God. Because uh, if he, seeing us as grasshoppers, well, a grasshopper is about 1 16th the size of a human being. And you've had to be about 400 million miles to be able to see us as grasshoppers, okay? That's a long way. That shows you how high up God is, even if it was less than 400 million. Okay, let's say it's 200 million or 100 million, whatever. Uh, the fact is that this is giving us a picture of a God way, way up high. And when he sees down that, uh, that below him, he sees the circle of the earth, okay? But the first thing I want you to understand is this is not a God that's 3,000 miles high because then the whole analogy he's trying to, to draw here would fall apart. This is a God that's way up high, many more than 3,000 miles. I mean, the flat earth is what, uh, 24,000 miles across at least? And the God of it is only 3,000 miles, one-eighth of the total diameter of the flat earth? That, that sounds hard to believe. Okay, especially when we will look at other scriptures like say Jeremiah 31 verse 37 it says Thus says the Lord if the heavens above can be measured And the foundations of the earth below can be explored then I will cast off all the descendants of Israel For all that they have done says the Lord so in other words He's saying you can't measure the heavens. They're so high. You can't measure them Okay, and the earth is so big that you can't get down to the foundations. So what does that give us a picture of? It gives us a picture of a vast universe, not one that is a dome 3,000 miles high. Okay, because that analogy again would fall apart. Or Psalm 103 verse 11 says, As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the steadfast love toward those who fear him. 
or Isaiah 55, verse 9, which says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, again, the analogy is trying to draw here between how vast and intellectual his thoughts are compared to ours would fall apart with the, a heaven that was just 3,000 miles high. You see, when we look up at the stars, we know they're millions of miles away. And then we look at them and we marvel. And God says, well, I'm, I'm even higher than they are, if you want to use an analogy, if we can use an analogy with God and his thoughts. But that's what he tells his people. So um, <clears throat> this is the kind of picture that the scripture is drawing for us that we have to deduce from the information that it's giving us. There's another passage that comes into play here, and that's uh, Job 22, verse 14. And here we're going to get a little exegetical, so bear with me, and uh, I'll try to make it very simple. Job 22:14 says, Is not God high in the heavens? See, again, we have that same thing, God high in the heavens. See the highest stars, how lofty they are? Therefore, you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Thick clouds enwrap him so that he, so that he does not see, and he walks on the vault of heaven. All right, so we've already dealt with the first part of the verse about how high God is compared to the stars. And now we have this curious um, verse that says that he walks on the vault of heaven. Now, interestingly enough, the word there in Hebrew is kuk, same word that we just saw in Isaiah 40, 22, where he says the circle of the earth, the kuk of the earth. All right, and we saw in that passage where God is way, way high and he's looking down and what's he going to see if he sees a sphere? Well, he's not going to see a sphere, not that way high up. He's going to see a circle because that's what you see. You can't see the dimensions of a sphere if you're too far away from it. You're only going to see a circle. Now, um, in this passage it says, he walks on the kug of the heavens. But as you and I know, even in your model, the heavens are not a flat disk. So why would he say that he walks on the kug of the earth when already in Isaiah 40, 22, he said kug of the earth and Rob, and I think many of you here would interpret that as being a flat disk. But if he walks on the kug of the heavens, that means if you're going to say the kug refers to a flat disk, you're going to have to say that the heavens refer to a flat disk. And you know that's not true. Okay? What are the heavens? Well, at the least, the heavens are going to have to be hemispherical. Even in your model, the heavens are hemispherical because it's a dome. Okay? In my model, it's actually not a hemisphere, it's a full sphere. Okay? But at least I'm allowed to do that because the word kug is not limited to a flat disk in the Hebrew, which is proven by its usage in Job 22:14. okay? So the upshot is this. If the flat earther, as many of you as you are, insists that kug in Isaiah 40, 22 is a flat disk, then they must also say, that the heavens are a flat disk, since kug is used to describe the hemisphere or the sphere of the heavens. <clears throat> Conversely, if both the earth and the heavens are spherical, then there is no contradiction in using kug in Isaiah 40.22 and Job 22.14, because kug is a much more expansive word than how it is limited in how the flat earth exegetical framework looks at it. Okay? So there we have it. Now here is um, one more verse I want to tackle before I get into the firmament is Isaiah 22:18. 18. 
And the reason this is important is because this, is, this passage is often used by flat earthers to say that if Isaiah wanted to teach us about a sphere, he would have used a different word than kook. And in Isaiah 22, 18, it says, and I don't, I'm not going to quote the exact verse, but it says here, to, God's talking to Israel for their apostasy, and he says to them, I will throw you like a ball into the next country. Okay, and that's the word door in Hebrew. And actually, when you look at it, this is technical, but it, it, it's actually pronounced kador because the ka in Hebrew is, means like. I will throw you like a ball into the next country, okay? But we're gonna focus on the root word door. Now, so the flat earther would make an argument and say, well, look, the Hebrew writer here is using the word door and he's associating that with a ball. And we know a ball is spherical, correct? Yep. So if he wanted in Isaiah 40, 22 to say, the sphere of the earth, wouldn't he have used the, the Hebrew word door instead of kook? This seems like a logical argument, <laughs> okay? But does it really mean anything? Well, it really doesn't mean anything, especially when you go in to examine this Hebrew word door, okay? And this is where the exegesis of a passage really becomes dependent on how deep you go into the etymology of the word, how it's used in the rest of scripture, and are you able to plug it back into the, the verse that you're reading and make sense out of it, okay? For example, uh, the word door, it's only used three times in the Hebrew Bible, okay? And sometimes it doesn't refer to a ball. It could. But the Hebrew word really means something that rolls. And something that rolls could be a ball, it could be a disc, it could be a cylinder, it could be a log, it, it could be a lot of things that roll, okay? And so what, what's happening here, and, and the reason you can come to this conclusion is because you look up how this word is used in other passages of scripture, okay? Uh, so, you know, that, that's one thing that we have to be very careful of. So as you can see what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to deduce from Scripture what direction does Scripture lead us into when it concerns the shape of the earth. Okay, so far, and I've already covered a very little bit of the 750 pages here, so far we see it leaning to the sphere. And that's just based on two words that we've covered so far. That's kook and door. Okay? Now, in the remaining 13 minutes that I have, let me talk about the firmament a little bit. Okay, so here's the dilemma with the firmament. I mean, I understand what Rob said, and I appreciate every etymological nuance that he put on that word, and I agree. Okay, but then there comes the interpretation of the passage, and the, the major passage here is Genesis chapter one. How are we gonna fit this thing in there? Because here are the difficulties you have to overcome. If the firmament is a solid dome, why does Genesis one insist that the stars and the sun are placed in the firmament? In the firmament. Now in Hebrew, there's a special way to say in something. If I wanted to say, uh, uh, in this book, or in this box, or uh, something like that, um, I would put the Hebrew uh, uh, letter bet, that's like RB. I would put the, word, the Hebrew letter bet before the root word, and that would be translated as in whatever the root word was, in the, you know, in the refrigerator or whatever, okay? Um, if I wanted to say inside, a little di bit different than in, okay, I would use the Hebrew letter mem. So it would be mem root word, okay? Whoa! <laughs> Whoa. 
Now, if I wanted to say um, underneath, let's say underneath the firmament, okay, there's a special word I would use. Uh, that would be mitikat, okay? Or there's another, a couple other Hebrew words like that. Uh, matzah would mean uh, underneath the firmament. Now, why is all this important? Well, because if the birds are flying in the firmament and the sun and the stars are in the firmament and the firmament's solid, well, how are they going to fly in something solid that's so firm that you can't penetrate it, which is the description that Rob gave to it, the firmament? Can't be. See, so if Rob says, well, let's get down and interpret the scripture very literally, okay, let's do that. If the, word, if the Hebrew letter bet is before the word and it means in, then why are you saying that the birds fly underneath the firmament and the stars and the sun are placed underneath the firmament? Because they're surely not in the firmament. And there's a very particular way in Hebrew to say in the firmament. Okay? So that's the trouble you get into when you confine the Hebrew word rakia to something hard and don't uh, look at the other nuances to that word, um, namely its flexibility, okay? So that's a big problem. And I haven't heard one, um, one um, answer to that problem from anybody who really uh, tries to exegete the scripture, okay? Uh, it's one thing to say that the firmament is hard. It's quite another to tell us how the birds are going to fly in it and the sun and the moon and the stars are going to move in it if it's so hard. So um, as a matter of fact, in Genesis 1.20, it says the birds fly on the face of the firmament. On the face of the firmament. Well, that makes sense because if the firmament is inner and outer space, and the birds fly very close to the surface of the earth. You know, they could go into trees and we see them fly a little above the trees. Well, that's pretty close to the surface of the earth. Well, that's the face of the firmament because the firmament is the whole sky above them and they're flying right at the bottom face of the firmament. So that makes sense that they can do that, okay? Um, the other difficulty is the word rakia in Hebrew, from which we get the word firmament, and, and before I say this, um, when, in my book, you'll see I examined 43 translations of the Hebrew word rakia. And out of those 43 translations, uh, there were 12 different words that were used among those 43 translations. And why is that? Well, because the word rakia is very hard to understand in Hebrew. On the one hand, it means something hard. On the other hand, it means something flexible. On the other, and, and, and so you, the, the word firmament is firm. That's why that translation was used from the Latin. But then you have other translations saying an expanse, something that's ethereal, something that's, you know, like, uh, like air or space or something like that. And then you'll find words in between. As a matter of fact, there was one translation that said, God made something on the second day. <laughs> God made something, because he, he doesn't, he, he, the translator who knows the Hebrew, it can't come down firm on what the rakia really is, okay? All we can really go by is the characteristics of the rakia. What, what are we allowed to do in the rakia? Well, we know the birds can fly in the rakia, in the firmament. We know the sun and moon stars can move in it. So even though it's something hard, it's got to be something flexible, Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to move in it. That makes perfect sense. <clears throat> now, let's look at this logically, scientifically, if we can. Is God trying to tell us something here that's really way above the science that we've known for 2,000 years? Is he, I mean, he's just way ahead of the curve. As far as I'm concerned, in using this word rocky, God is just telling us, I'm so far ahead of you guys that it's going to take you centuries to catch up to me in understanding what this rocky is. 
Let's just take, let's take an example, this room. This room is filled with air. Nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, a little bit of argon, a few other uh, elements. That's what we're breathing in this room, okay? You can't see it. You can breathe it, you know you're breathing. If you breathe real hard, you're gonna know you're breathing in something, okay? And is there any space in this room that is not occupied by air? If it was, if there was, it would be a vacuum. We'd have a vacuum somewhere in this room. Every conceivable space in this room is occupied by air, okay? But let's say we did get a vacuum hose in here. We shut the, everything up, taped it all up, make sure nothing could escape, and we had a hose in there, and we start sucking the air out of this room. You would still have air, but you would have, you would have less of it, okay? You'd have less of it, but what's gonna fill the space between the molecules of air that you t just took out with your vacuum? What's gonna fill that space between the nitrogen and oxygen? Because now, before we put the vacuum on it, they were real close, and now that we put the vacuum in here and sucked out most of the air, well then, those molecules are now far apart. But what's in between them? What's in between them? Well, somebody will say, there's nothing between them. And I'll say, that's impossible, because nothing doesn't exist, metaphysically speaking. Nothing doesn't exist. There has to be something, okay? What is that something? Well, we don't know, okay? We don't know, but there is something, and that's what outer space is. There's a something out there. It's not a nothing. If it was a nothing between us and the moon, for example, then the moon would be right next to the earth. Because if nothing can exist between the earth and the moon, that means the earth and the moon would have to coalesce. Okay? The point being is this. When the Bible is saying that the rakia, the firmament, is the space that the birds fly in and the outer space that the sun, moon, and stars move in, they can do so because God created a substance so discreet, so fine, so solid, so hard, and yet so flexible. Hard and flexible at the same time. Only God could do that. Because if it's a substance, and an outer space has to be a substance, it can't be nothing. It, science tells us that it can be the hardest thing that we could ever conceive of. Because it's so compact, more compact than the atom and its electrons ever could be because of the, of the way that God made it. So compact, and yet its indivisible particles are so small that they can be so flexible because of that smallness that birds could fly right through it without any problem whatsoever. Okay? Now, I am trying to be faithful to the, to the text because the text tells me that the birds fly in the firmament. And if it's some hard dome that rockets can't penetrate or that nothing from outer space can fall in, however it's described in the flat earth model, okay, that means that birds could not fly in it. But the text insists that birds do fly in it. Okay, now we already went through the Hebrew and I told you that Hebrew has very specific ways of telling us whether it's in, inside, or underneath. None of those words are used in Genesis 1. Okay? The only one that's used is bet and the root word, and that means they fly in this substance, whatever it is. Okay? And we know that he's, he's trying to tell us that because he, as he used the word firmament in the first verses from 6 to 9 in Genesis 1, he uses them again in verses 14 to 19. Three times he uses the same word. 
telling us that the birds fly in it and the stars and the sun move in it. So what we have here is basically um, in the first chapter of Genesis, we have matter being created. That's the earth and the water. We have energy being created. That was the light that God made on the first day. We have space being created, which is the rakia, and we have time being created, which is the evening and morning of each day of Genesis. So matter, energy, space, and time, all created, and that's all we have to live with. That's all we need, matter, energy, space, and time. Now, um, I have a minute left, and uh, since Rob talked about the helio versus uh, geocentric, um, what can I say? Um, you know, I wish we could all get together on this. I really do. I, I wish that, um, as I discovered 15 years ago, and one of the greatest discoveries I made was that the Earth was in the center of the universe and everything was revolving around it. Um, um, I just consider that one of the most phenomenal aspects of my life. And I'm very passionate about it, as you can tell. Um, you know, making a movie is not something easy, um, but we did it. And, you know, and at the same time, the whole Flat Earth movement took off. And, um, you know, I, I wish there was a way, because we do believe that the Earth is central, and uh, it is the apple of God's eye, and we all do believe that, and it's great, and I like to see that. But where we go from here, I don't know. My time is up. That is it. All right. Let me make a reminder, okay? First and foremost, Skiba, St. Genis, thank you very much. The reminder is, and we said it before, please, no comments or heckling during the debate, and maybe we should add no chiming in, okay? Let's be respectful for everybody sitting next to you that isn't blurting out. And I was actually told that if somebody does, you will be removed. Those are the rules. Thank you very much, and we ask for your cooperation. All right, now, that was the 30-minute, uh, obviously the 30 minutes for the opening statements, and now 15 minutes for rebuttal, followed by 15 minutes for closing remarks. Let me reset the timer here. I'll need my PowerPoint up and make sure the audio is ready also, please. <clears throat> when they are ready for that, Rob, I'll start your clock. I'll give you the countdown. Can we do an audio test first? Uh, if, the vo if the level's up, it should work. Okay. Yeah. All right, then. Here we go. In three, two, one, begin, Rob. Okay. Uh, for my rebuttal, I'd like to zero in on some of the things that we've both talked about as well as some of the things that you heard in Dr. Sengenis' opening remarks, and thank you for that, Dr. Sengenis. Um, let's start with the issue of the firmament. <clears throat> on page 263 of Dr. Sengenis' book, Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, under the title, What is the Firmament?, we see he starts out with three key points you see at the top there. He says, we read in Genesis 1, 6 through 9 that, one, the firmament is synonymous with the heavens. Two, the sun, moon, and stars are placed in the firmament. And three, the birds fly in the firmament. The only way for these three criteria to be fulfilled is to understand that the firmament is simply the constitution of space. We look up and see that the heavens are filled with a lot of space. We see that the celestial bodies reside in that space. Lower, towards the earth, we see the birds flying in the same space. There is nothing but space. As it stands, we do not see birds flying in a dome, and we do not see celestial bodies in a dome. If one wants to use dome as a translation for the Hebrew rakia, he can only say that the birds and stars exist underneath the, a dome, but they are not, as the text of Genesis 1 specifies, in the rakia, a very important point we will address later. <clears throat> 
Okay, so he's talking about in Genesis 1, the sun, moon, and stars being placed in the firmament, and in verse 20, we see that the birds are flying in the open firmament. Now, on page 306 of his book, this is where he later addresses the issue of in versus inside. This is a screenshot from page 308. He says, first, the Hebrew language, although it didn't have the most comprehensive vocabulary, did indeed have different words for in and inside. As Skiba as noted by Skiba himself, in is usually denoted by putting the letter bait before the noun. We find this information, for example, in the first phrase of Genesis 1, in the beginning, or the phrase in the firmament, in which bait begins, you got a typo there, brother, begins the word reading right to left in Hebrew. From when Hebrew, uh, but when Hebrew wants to say inside, it does not use a bait before the noun. Rather, it uses a different letter, the letter mem. For example, in Genesis 6.14, it says, and cover it inside and out with pitch. From the word mabit, if I, I'm, forgive me if I butcher these words. The same occurs in Leviticus 14.41, and he shall cause the inside of the house to be scraped around about. First Kings 6.15, he lined the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. In Second Chronicles 3.4, overlaid it on the inside with pure gold. Um, uh, you guys can look online at any website that teaches Hebrew. Hebrew for Christians is a good one that I've used. There's many others out there that you could use. I would direct your attention to this book right here. This is a really great book I've thoroughly enjoyed myself called Hebrew Word Pictures, How Does the Hebrew Alphabet Reveal Prophetic Truths by Dr. Frank T. Seekins. In this book, he goes into tremendous detail regarding each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, including how they're used as prefixes and suffixes and whatnot. So we see the letter bait. We say bait. The word bait means house. And the letter bait itself has the meaning of a house, a dwelling place, something that you live inside of. And you'll see where it says concerning the prefix, B added to the front of a Hebrew word, the letter bait is used to mean in, inside, or into. Likewise with related languages who derive similar meanings with the, their equivalent to the letter bait in Hebrew. He goes on to say, and differentiate between bait and mem, on pages 18 and 62, Dr. Seekins tells you point blank how these letters are used as prefixes and what they mean when you do. As you see there, bait means in, inside, into, whereas the letter mem means from or than. On page 185, he again explains the function of the letter mem as a prefix, a prefix meaning from. When mem is added as a prefix in front of a word, mem becomes the inseparable or the particle preposition that means from, unto, or than. The letter mem in front of a word is the equivalent of the Hebrew word min or from. See page 166 for more on that. So let's go back to Dr. Genesis. Uh, paragraph there, his examples, Genesis 6.14 uh, and so forth. Um, what's really being said there is from within or from the inside. That's a better way of understanding that. And to prove the point, please consider using software, something like scripture, the interlinear scripture analyzer, for example. It will show you the word right there and it means from inside. Okay, in Genesis 6.14, you can check that for yourself. And I want to thank my friend Andy Hoy, who is also a trained Hebrew scholar, for pointing something out to me. He said, in three of the four examples that St. Genesis uses, the letter mem precedes the word bait, which is the word for house, which, in fact, is the meaning of the letter bait. In this regard, Hoy says, quote, in some cases, bait, the word, is used to refer to interior features like a housing that is carved into something solid. As I understand it, a house with an interior or without an interior, e.g. a house filled with concrete, would cease to be a house because there would be no more inside left. This is why something like mabait could be literally translated as from house is actually better under, translated as inside because the word bait is always referring to something with an interior or that is capable of housing something, end quote. And in the remaining example, 2 Chronicles 3, 4, that Dr. St. Genis used, uh, likewise, it means the same thing, from inside. And we see it right there, from inside. Hence, again, to prove my point, we can better understand these passages to mean from within or from the inside. But in general, apart from these examples, uh, the letter bait is the prefix of choice when trying to convey the concept of in or inside of something. And mem is rather the prefix of choice to convey the idea of from or out of something. So, 
to the issue of birds flying inside the firmament, the text indicates that they are, in fact, flying under or toward it. We see there in Genesis 120, they're flying in the open firmament of the heavens. The word there is alpine, across the face. Uh, we see the same phrase, across the face there, meaning toward, in another passage. Um, we see in Genesis 18:16, the men rose from thence and looked toward Sodom. So alpine means toward. So we can think of the birds flying toward the firmament. Uh, we could see, looking into the Greek, that says they fly below the firmament. Or Dr. Syngenis can just pick up his Catholic Bible, and it would help him out probably tremendously to solve his problem here. It says the birds fly over the earth under the firmament of heaven. In short, this isn't rocket science we're dealing with here. <laughs> Still, like Dr. Syngenis, there are plenty of others out there who want to argue for the firmament as an expanse rather than a hard structure, such as Dr. Danny Faulkner and others uh, from an organization I now affectionately refer to as Answers Not Found in Genesis, because they rarely, if ever, provide any actual answers from Genesis when they make their hit pieces against us. So sorry, Danny, I know you're here, but I'm going to go after you right here. In his book, Universe by Design, on page 96, he writes, the translators of the Greek Septuagint rendered the Hebrew word rakia as stereoma, which Jerome followed as firmamentum in the Latin Vulgate, which in the authorized King James Version was transliterated as firm, firmament. This, according to Danny Faulkner, is a terrible translation. And many modern translations break, break from this to render rakia as expanse. The word stereoma conveys the meaning of something hard, so he admits it too, you know, he's being honest here, such as the crystalline spheres of ancient Greek cosmology upon which the stars were implanted. This is where, in my opinion, he goes off the rails. Thus, the translators of the Septuagint incorporated the current cosmology of their day into their own translation. This is very similar to those who wed the Big Bang to the Genesis creation account today. Um, Sorry, Danny, but this is an outrageously unacceptable <laughs> example that you have here and cannot even remotely pass for respectable scholarship. This is eisegesis at its, best, at its best, and I submit that he's being guilty of the very thing that he's accusing the translators of the Septuagint of doing. And the Septuagint is actually important if you look into the history of the Septuagint. So the story goes, 72 Jewish scholars, six from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, according to Philo of Alexandria, were asked by the Greek king of Egypt, Ptolemy II, to translate the Torah from Biblical Hebrew into Greek for inclusion in the Library of Alexandria. The following narrative explains how this was done, and it is found in the pseudepigraphic letter of Aristius to his brother Philocrates. It is likewise repeated by Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, and various other sources, including St. Augustine, among others. And the story is, King Ptolemy once gathered 72 elders. He placed them in 72 chambers, each of them in a separate one, without revealing to them why they were summoned. He entered each one's room and said, write for me the Torah of Moshe, your teacher. And God put it in the heart of each one to translate identically as the others did. So Dr. Faulkner would have you believe that these guys individually separated into rooms just decided to randomly pull from the so-called cosmology of the Greeks at the time and all decided to use the word stereoma. When the reality of it is, the Hebrew scholars were treating their Torah, which is the most sacred thing to the Hebrews, uh, with extreme reverence and chose the appropriate Greek word to convey solidity in Greek from the Hebrew word rakia. We also see that the writers of the Septuagint did not agree with the cosmology of their day in the case of the word chug. The history of the formation of the Septuagint is largely lost, and we do not know if the prophets were translated, prophets like the book of Isaiah, in Alexandria as the Torah was in the third century BC. But if they were, and if the translators were familiar with the concept of a spherical earth taught at the Musion of Alexandria, then the center of Greek science, they give no hint of it in their translation of chug. Again, that's Dr. Schneider. He continues, a circle is no more a sphere than it is uh, in scripture than it is in geometry. Looking at these usages together, I'm hard put to see how anyone could justify rendering chug in Isaiah 40.22 as sphericity. The earliest translations of these scriptures bear this out. In the Septuagint, the translators render the nominal and verbal forms of chug in every case with the Greek gyros, circle or ring, which they use in Isaiah 40, 22a, or gyru for the verb form, to make or inscribe a circle. Gyros does not mean sphere, and in fact, nowhere in any Greek recension of the Hebrew scriptures will one find the proper word sphera 
use in this context at all. Now, Dr. Sengenis claimed a little min few minutes ago that the Hebrews did not have a word for sphere. If I had more time, I would certainly dispute that. But let's say he's correct. They did have the appropriate corresponding word in Greek and Latin, which they could have used if that was their understanding of Chug. If that's what they really believe Chug would, they, was, they could have easily chosen the appropriate words in the much more robust languages of Greek and Latin, but they didn't. So the problem for Dr. Sengenis and company is that the translators didn't use any word for a sphere in Greek or Latin because they were being faithful to the actual meaning of Chug, meaning a circle. But again, I do believe they actually did know the difference, and Isaiah in particular had the opportunity to describe the earth as a spherical object, but he didn't take it. And I've had this meme passed around for quite some time. You've probably seen it. Look, language 101 guides words mean things. Isaiah knew the difference. The King James translators knew the difference. Do you know the difference, Dr. Sengenis, Dr. Faulkner, and others? Uh, you, Google will help you out, but I'll just go ahead and give you a little hint right here. This is a ball. Uh, this is a circle boys and girls. Now, some people will say that when God's looking down from infinite distance in space, he looks down and sees the earth as a globe, and of course it looks like a circle. Well, that's not actually true. That's not what he would see if he's looking down from the north, as scripture says where he is. He would see a half circle. The only way you're going to get a circle is if you're sitting in the sun or somewhere between the sun and the earth. Then we run into issues of sun god worship and other things like that. You're not going to get a circle when you're looking down from above the earth. You're going to get a half circle. There are many other witnesses, and I got two minutes. Man, I can barely say hello in 15 minutes. Good grief. The phrase face of the earth is used 29 times in the King James Bible. People will tell us, well, circle, you know, that's not a real figure in geometry in three-dimensional space. Well, if you want to use geometry, go to any geometry website and look at what a surface is, right? Each flat surface is called a face. Flat surface has face, whereas a spherical object does not have a face. We have other references, internal references, in the earth or on the earth. The phrase in the earth is used 76 times in the King James Bible. Here's a double whammy for you, Job 30, uh, 38, 33. It says, and it is turned round about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the earth, or, excuse me, upon the face of the world in the earth. Hmm. We see in Job 38, 33, knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? The dominion of heaven is in the earth? What's going on here? Well, when you look at the word, the Hebrew letter bait precedes the word aretz, which is a word for earth, which can mean the ground or also the world in which we live. In the earth is the appropriate translation for ba'aretz, whereas you'll see King James say on the earth, but it's the same exact word, in the earth, properly translated. If you want to say on the earth, look to like Leviticus 11.2, where it has the preposition al and ha'aretz, preceded with the Hebrew letter he, meaning the on the earth would be that way. If you look up phrases where the King James says on the earth, the only one that gets it right actually is the Young's literal translation. Why? Because it's being literally true to the text. Ends of the earth, four corners of the earth. We have phrases like ends of the earth. Where's the end of the ball? Four corners. Where are the four corners on a ball? Can't really use north, south, east, and west, right, as your cardinal points. Aside from the military academy, where's the west point? Where's the east point? Where's the east pole? Where's the west pole? Can't do that. Works in our model. Unfortunately, I got six seconds and won't be able to get to it. Phrase end of heaven is used because the heavens are attached to the earth. The name is 9-6. Time's up. Okay. Hello. Okay, there we go. It's this one. All right. So, Genesis, you will have 15 minutes again, and I will begin that in three, two, one. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Rob. I'm glad that we talked about the uh, Hebrew prefixes mem and bet, and uh, so that's what I want to go over first, because it's such an important point. Now, you are correct that when you put the, Hebrew, the prefix mem in front of a root word, it can mean from or then, but it also means inside. So I, I hope you weren't giving the impression that it only means from or then, because there's a lot of Hebrew words, I looked them up, in which the translation is inside when mem is the prefix, uh, which is different than bet. 
Now, um, that being said, um, even if you were trying to draw something from that prefix mem, that prefix is not used in Genesis 1. That was the whole point of my presentation was that only the prefix bet was used in Genesis 1. And that word, that prefix, by your own words, you said bet is the prefix of choice for the words in or inside. Okay, so um, basically you were just proving my point. Because my point was that if the Hebrew writer wanted to make a distinction between in or inside the firmament, that is underneath the firmament, he could have used other Hebrew prefixes or other Hebrew words, but he didn't. He only used the prefix bet, which according to your own understanding is the uh, word, a prefix of choice for in. So we're still stuck with the same problem. The, the Hebrew of Genesis 1 uh, makes a point in every place that it talks about the firmament, it says, bet rakia. So it's in the firmament. And that me in Hebrew, that means it's in the house. It's not, uh, um, I mean, inside the house, inside the vacant space of the house. It's not in the roof. It's not in the wood. You see, that's the hard part of the house, the wood and the roof and the walls, that's the hard part. So literally speaking, the Hebrew is saying that it's in that wood or in that roof or in those walls, but that's an impossibility. Especially if your understanding of the word rakia is that it's so firm that nothing can penetrate it. Uh, so, again, this goes right back to the definition of rakia that I was trying to demonstrate in Hebrew, which is, yes, something firm, because it's a substance, yet something flexible. It has to be flexible because the birds have to fly in it, and the sun, moon, and stars have to move in it. So we haven't moved beyond that difficulty. Um, now, you had made the comment um, that there was a translation that said, below the firmament, and you wanted me to take a look at that and, and said that, uh, I forget what your exact words were, but you said basically, uh, Dr. Sengenis, look at this translation that says below the firmament. Well, that's the whole problem, is that they have no basis to, to make that translation. Because if you wanted to say below the firmament in Hebrew, you would say matzarakia underneath or below the firmament. But that word is not used in Genesis 1. The only, pre, the only word we have is the, with the prefix bet, which always means in, okay? So, and then you asked me to look at the Catholic Bible. And the Catholic Bible says under the firmament. Well, this just proves my point because they know that you can't have a star in the firmament. You can't have a bird fly in the firmament. You can only have it underneath the firmament. That just made sense to the translator. So that's the way he translated it. So, but again, this just proves my point, is that they know you can't have it in the firmament. It has to be underneath the firmament. So um, again, we haven't moved past this, this problem. And I don't know if you have any more you want to say about it in your next uh, closing remarks, but um, it is a still, it's a sticky point. Now, um, you mentioned the Hebrew writer used the word kug, and he could have used the Latin or the Greek. Um, well, I don't know which Hebrews you're referring to. Um, you know, maybe Hebrews uh, near the first century AD or something could use Latin or Greek, because those languages were in vogue then, or maybe a few centuries prior to that, they could have used it. But those, uh, those, uh, the, the reason the Hebrew is so important is because that's the divinely inspired language that God chose to write Genesis chapter 1. And if God avoids all those words in Hebrew that mean underneath or 
or, or uh, below or something of that sort, well, we, had, we have to pay attention to those, those choices God made uh, that uh, Moses was divinely inspired to write. So I really don't care what the Latin says. I don't care what the Greek says because they weren't inspired by God. And the New Testament says precious little about this subject that we're talking about. So the Greek is not really going to come in handy for us. This step, you know, if you want to use the aroma to, to uh, talk about, but that's still not a, a divinely inspired word. Now, um, you said that if you're looking above, like I had described from Isaiah 40:22 where God is way, way, way above and looking at a sphere, what's he going to see? And I said he's going to see a circle. Now, you said that he's going to see a half circle. Now, I can't wrap my brain around that because a half circle is a is half circle. It's, it's, it's a circle that's only drawn halfway. So if he's looking at a globe from above, why is he not going to see a circle? That's, uh, that's puzzling. So if you can clear that up for me. Yeah, but that's... Looking down from above. Yeah, well, as the sun turns around, it's going to light up the rest of it. So, you oh, know, okay. he's not going to... See. <laughs> he's, seeing a whole, he's seeing a whole circle because the light's going to go around in 24 hours. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, and the other thing about circle is... Circle is an abstract word because a circle, as we, let's say I draw a circle on a piece of paper like this, okay? Unless I'm going to count the thickness of the ink that I drew that circle with, a circle is basically a two-dimensional figure, okay? A sphere is a three-dimensional figure. A disc is also a three-dimensional figure. Okay, so um, if you're trying to make an argument that he's going to see um, a circle, that really doesn't tell you a whole lot. It doesn't tell you whether he's going to see a sphere or a disc because both of those are three-dimensional. So there's a, in other words, there's a limitation to this Hebrew word kook because it's talking in the abstract about a shape of a circle, but we don't know exactly how to apply that. And we, so we need, in other words, what I'm trying to say is we need other information from the Bible, which I went through, as to how we're going to apply the word circle to the things that we see. That may not be a, such a big point uh, to you right now, but um, now in the six minutes I have left, um, I'm going to go back to some things that you said earlier that I want to deal with. First of all, let me uh, deal with this idea of the stars falling from the sky. All right, there are basically four passages, uh, three in Isaiah, one in the Apocalypse, that talk about this issue. If you look at the language that it uses in the Hebrew, um, it's not that the stars are falling to the earth in the sense that these stars have to be little meteorites, uh, little uh, objects of light that are much smaller than what we understand stars to be today. That does not have to be the case. Um, first of all, the apocalypse is, in, is talking in figurative language, and so is Isaiah. And if you look at the Hebrew word there, it actually means the, fall, the stars will fall toward the earth. It doesn't necessarily mean that these stars are little and will actually hit the earth. That's a misconception. And this understanding of the Hebrew word fits precisely with the cosmology that we understand today, if you're a geocentrist, because the earth is in the middle of the universe, all the stars are outside in one big sphere, and if they all, at one time, at the end of the world, fall toward the earth, that's it. It's over. That's the big conflagration. That's the, the end of the world. All the, the, the cosmos is, is collapsed. It all falls toward the center. Everything blows up, and that's it, you see. So the stars can be, you know, multi-dimensional. Uh, uh, I mean, not multi-dimensional. They could be uh, many times bigger 
than little meteorites. So they don't have to be that way, okay? So we can accommodate that, that passage in Isaiah 34 and Apocalypse 7 uh, qu quite well. Um, you also, uh, Rob also went through all these authors that um, talk about uh, how the book of Genesis is to be interpreted, especially when they come to the firmament. And they say, well, the firmament has to be a dome and the earth has to be flat and all these things. And yeah, I know, there's a lot of scholars who, who write that. And I was under the impression that uh, they were all correct as well. And the reason that they claim to be correct was because they claim that the Hebrews got that information from the ancient Mesopotamian cultures that lived before them. And that these Mesopotamian cultures, uh, who didn't know really how the world was constructed, made up all kinds of things. One of them was a flat earth with a dome over it. And there were different variations of uh, the flat earth and, and the dome among different ancient Mesopotamian cultures. And the, the liberal scholarship that we've all been under for decades now has made the claim that the Hebrews basically just took these Mesopotamian texts, rearranged them a little bit to fit their Hebrew sensitivities, and voila, we have the same basic construction of the universe that these Babylonian cultures had. And that was an abiding theory, and it really fit really like a glove for them. Because you know what they did after that? They'd say, well, but we know that isn't the truth. We know there isn't a dome. We know that the earth isn't flat, so we can make up anything we want. Voila, we have the Big Bang Theory, and we have evolution, and we have all kinds of ideas about what's out there in space, you see. So what I'm trying to say is this whole idea of the firmament with the dome was some cockamamie idea that was thought up by liberal scholars who had no respect whatsoever for the Bible and we're trying to figure out, well, where did this come from? Well, it came from these pagan Mesopotamian people over here. That's where we'll say it came from. And we know they're, they're really not up on cosmology. Okay? And this will give us an excuse to make up any cosmology you want. And that's exactly what we have today. Okay? And uh, you can read my book and find out about this by a guy named Wayne Horowitz, who wrote a dissertation on this very topic. And so he went to investigate all those Mesopotamian cultures, and he concluded that it was a big lie. It was a big lie that these Mesopotamian cultures only produced a cosmology of a firmament with uh, a flat earth. He said that was very rare, if ever you saw it. And he says they had spheres, they had cubes, they had all kinds of ideas in these Mesopotamian cultures. One of the prominent ones was a sphere. Okay, so I recommend that you, that you pick up that. Go look at the reference in my book, read it, find out for yourself. Okay, so what does this do? This, this frees us up. This frees us up to look at the text in a much different way. And that's what I'm trying to do here for you. I'm trying to show you that you can't look at it as a dome with a flat earth, because it's not going to fit the other language that's in Genesis chapter 1. You just can't do that, okay? And, and we went over other passages that won't allow it either. Now, 30 seconds, okay. Um, let me see. I'll tell you what I'll do is I'm going to save a lot of these for my final uh, statements because I can't cover it in 15 seconds, okay? So I'll yield the rest of my time. Okay, I'm going to reset the clock here for the closing statements. 15 minutes. Yeah. We will start with Rob. And I'll need the PowerPoint up again and the um, audio for the laptop. And when that is up, we will go in three, two, one. You are on, Rob. 
All right. Well, I think it's convenient to write it all off as liberal scholarship. It's a convenient cop-out, in my opinion. I also think the audience is intelligent enough to understand what I was saying about the in inside issue, so I'm not going to address that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and conclude with saying, look, look at all the references you see on the screen there. The topic of this, this, this bait is, what does the Bible have to say about the shape and nature of the earth and its place in the cosmos? So I maintain that we live in a self-contained three-tiered system with heaven, earth, underworld, according to all the texts that you see there. Now I want to remind the audience of something my opponent said in the clip that I played earlier at the beginning of this. <clears throat> This is a whole big issue because if there's a dome, uh, well, yeah, then the earth has to be flat. There's really no other way to look at it. All right, so remember that. Now, even the Vatican agrees with me. I was pleasantly surprised to find. Now, I personally do not give any credibility or credence to the Catholic Church for anything, any measure of truth in my world. Uh, however, my opponent does. That's a big thing for him. And the Pope, in his worldview, being the Vicar of Christ, uh, the title implying his supremacy and universal primacy, both of honor and jurisdiction over the Church of Christ, I would presume that jurisdiction includes making sure that their website accurately uh, represents their church. If you go to the Vatican's website and look up the the English Bible that they have on the Vatican website. Remembering what Dr. Sengenis just said a minute ago, I would like the audience and Dr. Sengenis, if he can see the screen, to read the words highlighted in red when we get to them. Verse 6, then God said, let there be what? A dome in the middle of the waters. Verse 7, God made what? The dome. Verse 8, God called what? The dome, the sky. Uh-oh. Their own concordance says the word dome is used 11 times in their Bible. I would like to point out the, uh, the reference to Psalm 150 was rather interesting to me. Psalm 150, verse 1. Hallelujah! Praise God in his holy sanctuary. Give praise in the mighty dome of the heavens. Uh-oh. And they have a footnote there. It says, his holy sanctuary, God's temple on earth. The mighty dome of the heavens. Literally, God's strong vault. Heaven is here imagined as a giant plate separating the inhabited world from the waters of the heavens. We see in the book of Revelation chapter 4, and after this I had a vision of an open door. Footnote, the ancients viewed the heaven as a solid vault entered by way of actual doors. So the word vault is interchangeable with their understanding of firmament as a dome. We see that this is the dome in Amos 9.6, the vault that is attached to the earth. The same vault when he marked out the vault over the face of the deep and made firm the skies above in Proverbs 8. Looking at Isaiah chapter 40, their translation is rather interesting. In verse 22, he sits enthroned above the vault of the earth. So here they imagine the circle of the earth as essentially the vault we just saw is synonymous with dome. That while well, if you look, what, is, what shape is the rim of a dome? It is a circle. So they say the circle of the earth is the vault of the earth right here. Uh, we also see in Genesis 1, to help clear up this issue, I don't know why it's so hard for you to understand this, Dr. St. Genesis, of the birds, but here again I'll point you to your own church's website, Bible. Then God said, let the water teem with an abundance of living creatures on the earth. Let the birds fly. What? Uh oh Beneath the dome of the sky. So for someone who is extremely dogmatic about the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, it would appear that you must now concede that the Bible on your church's own headquarters website, no less, argues in my favor, not yours. Therefore, since I've clearly established that the Bible, even the official one put out by the Roman Catholic Church that you deem to be the final authority, fully agrees with me, I'm happy to welcome you into the enclosed world cosmology. You're welcome to the club, bro. You're well loved here. Because by your own words, you said, uh, well, you know, if there's a dome, uh, well, yeah, then the earth has to be flat. There's really no other way to look at it. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I have just won the debate. The debate is over. Yo, Adrian! Yoshira! I did it. Thank you very much. However, I still have plenty of time left, so I'll go ahead and take it. We do see that the firmament is indeed a solid vault over us, according to all the texts that you see there. Why? Because Yahuwah's throne sits above that, and the waters are also above it. There are floodgates and windows in the firmament, according to the text you see there. The sun, moon, and stars are inside the firmament, 
inside and all the stars shall fall to earth, not zip past them or whatever, light speed, whatever you're thinking. The earth is inscribed in a circular flat fashion into something with four corners and surrounded by water, according to all the texts that you see there. Earth is a geocentric, stationary world set on pillars, according to the texts that you see there. Now, in my remaining time, I want to revisit something Dr. Faulkner brought up, and that is the whole concept of men imposing their own ideas onto the scripture. We've already noted here that contrary to Dr. Faulkner's ridiculously absurd assumption, at least up until about 100 years or so prior to Christ's birth, the Jews still understood the firmament to be a hard, solid structure, indicated by the fact that they translated their Hebrew rakia into stereoma in Greek, they, they, the appropriate use of the Greek word there. This belief apparently remained intact about 100 years or so after Christ's birth, at least within the Jewish sect of the Pharisees. This we know from the testimony of Josephus. Uh, we see here, first century uh, Pharisee and historian, on the second day he placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament around it and put it together in a manner agreeable to the earth and fitted it for giving moisture and rain and for affording the advantage of dews. But things begin to change not too long thereafter when we enter the writings of the so-called early church fathers. Now in this regard, I would ask Dr. Syngenis and the audience to consider the possibility that if Christians today, even Catholic popes, bishops, priests, and Protestant creationists can and all too often do allow the ideas of secular, often atheistic science, in quotes, to influence the way they view scripture, could not the same thing have been possible with the so-called early church fathers? I suggest it was not only possible, but quite self-evident. And on pages 239 and 240 of his book, Dr. Syngenis nearly admits as much. And this becomes especially apparent to any objective person when it is even openly acknowledged that characters like Clement of Alexandria, who was born about 50 years after Josephus, was famously known for incorporating Greek philosophy into his presentations of scripture. You look characters like this up in an encyclopedia, for, in this case right here, it says Clement of Alexandria was an early Christian philosopher and one of the most distinguished teachers of the Church of Alexandria. He is known for his attempt to unite Greek philosophy with Christian teachings and drew a large number of educated pagans to the church. Do you think they might have brought a little bit of baggage with them when they came into the church? I think so. His passion for philosophy, especially for the teachings of Plato, contributed to the Hellenization of Christianity. Of course, I find this rather interesting in light of Dr. Faulkner's accusation of incorporating modern cosmology into scripture. Why? Because today we have Catholic popes, the so-called vicar of Christ, in Dr. St. Genesis' worldview, capitulating to monkey man science and publicly stating acceptance of Big Bang cosmology and Darwinian evolution. The Big Bang itself, of course, being a theory originally put forward by Jesuit-trained Catholic priest. Since Pope John Paul, each pope has progressively and systematically been yielding to alleged discoveries of quote-unquote science, all while still conveniently allowing for God to still have a hand in it somehow. But all of this nullifies the creation account. Either creation, either creation happened in six literal days, precisely as described, or it didn't. There could be no blending of billions of years ago and evolution through mutation with the descriptions of special creation given in Genesis. They are not compatible ideas. And yet at the highest levels of the Catholic Church, we are being led to believe that they are. In his book, Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, Dr. Sagenis spends a significant amount of time, in chapters 3 and 4 especially, quoting the early church fathers, showing how a great many of them believed and taught a spherical earth. On page 197, in the section titled, A Detailed Analysis of Augustine's View, he quotes a patristic scholar named C.P.E. Nothaft, who attempts to refute another author named Ferrari regarding the latter's notion that Augustine held to a flat earth concept of cosmology. After describing the classic spherical earth of the Greek cosmology at the time, Nothaft says, quote, since Augustine received a classical pagan education, so he's another one with a classic pagan education, which included some engagement in Platonic philosophy, there is no reason to doubt he was familiar with this picture, end quote. Meaning his education would have certainly led him to believe in the earth as a globe based on the dominant views of Plato, Aristotle, and those who came before them, Thus, it is not at all likely he would have embraced flat earth cosmology is the conclusion. And this Dr. Syngenis clearly shows to be the case as he uses Augustine and many others to support the idea that the church fathers clearly believed in a spherical earth. 
But in reality, I submit for the audience's consideration that all Dr. Syngenis has proven with the testimonies of the early church fathers is the scripture, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, while Solomon's words were meant to encourage training a child in the word of God, the saying still holds true regardless. When you are taught something from an early age, of course you're going to believe it, and such long-held beliefs are going to be very hard to overcome. Remember, after the events of Passover, Yahuwah delivered the Israelites from Egypt in a day, but it took another 40 years to deliver the Egypt out of them, right? It took quite some time. So all of this quotes from early church fathers and all that only proves the effect that a pagan education, a secular education, can have on the mind of men of faith and those they disciple. Could this be the reason why the Roman Catholic Church has officially remained non-committed on this issue? On page 211 of his book, Dr. Syngenis admits, the fact is that the church has never made an official statement that the earth is either flat or spherical. Thus, Dr. Syngenis cannot claim solo ecclesia to support his case. We must therefore defer to the sole authority of scripture for our answer, which was the purpose of this debate. And once again, I maintain from Genesis to Revelation, this is what you see in the scriptures. And in this regard, the fact remains that nothing in the Bible even remotely hints at any notion of a tiny spherical earth spinning, orbiting, or otherwise, hanging in a vast, ever-expanding vacuum of space. Nothing. Interestingly enough, the Pope's own astronomer agrees with me. Here's a clip from him. A couple of years ago, I was asked to do a Bible study group. I'm thinking Catholics don't do Bible studies, you know. <laughs> to do a Bible study group in Houston with a bunch of astronauts. Astronauts, oh, I could do that, yeah. One of the guys um, came up to me and said, you know, I just want to let you know, I believe in the absolute truth that creation was made in the six days just as described in the book of Genesis. And that's my religion, I just want to let you know that ahead of time. And I'm thinking, you know, have you actually read Genesis? Where it says the world is flat and it's covered with a dome and there's water above and below the dome, you know. Where does the shuttle go? How come you don't get wet? Once again, showing at the highest levels of the Vatican, they both admit to the reality of what scripture says while simultaneously denying it. The Catholic Church opposes itself. Indeed, the Catholic Church, you know, led by the Pope, right? The Pope. Uh, Pope John Paul, in this case, speaking at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1996, he said, truth cannot contradict truth, and yet they have the truth of scripture, which clearly describes a flat dome-enclosed world, even by their own admission on their own website, while simultaneously dismissing it in favor of the supposed truths of monkey man science. It reminds me of the episode of Star Trek where the probe nomad scans Lieutenant Uhura. After declaring it had become quite unsettled by the experience with that unit, Mr. Spock says, that unit is a woman. To which nomad replied, a mass of conflicting impulses. So too is the church, but sadly it's not just the Catholic church. Creation ministries, Protestants, evangelicals, they're all just as bad, if not worse, when it comes to the issue of trying to marry scripture to secular science. And this is the danger of going outside of the written word of God for truth. It took over 1,800 years for the Catholic Church to create the doctrine of Mary's Immaculate Conception. Are we on the verge of a new doctrine concerning the plurality of worlds? See, this is what's at stake here. Scripture says we're it. We're the center stage main attraction. The entirety of creation, the whole account, testifies to the singular world of earth and Yahuwah's plan for it. I'm going to run out of time, so I don't have time to go into this. You can take a screen, a screenshot of this later or whatever but, and read those texts right there. But the Catholic Church openly embraces the possibility of other worlds inherent in the Copernican model of Dr. Faulkner and, the, and other people, of course, and indeed even in the geocentric universe of Dr. Syngenis. Again, I don't have time to go over all this. You can read that here. But they, you know, you can read it in the archive video or whatever, but here they are saying ETs might not have fallen into sin as man has. Now we have popes and Jesuit astronomers willing to baptize aliens. But worse still is the notion that they may not need it. The aliens may not need to be ba baptized. In the highlighted portion of the screenshot there with the pope, the former Vatican astronomer is quoted as saying that we might want to convert to their, i.e. the aliens, faith. Perhaps they didn't fall. So in conclusion, you know, I believe a great deception is coming, and if so, who are we going to, in whom are we going to place our trust concerning the true nature of our world and its place in the cosmos? Monkey man science, falsely so-called, or the holy word of God? Well, 
As for me and my house, I say let God be true and every man a liar. Thank you. Hello. All right, there we go. All right. Let me get this clock reset so Robert can uh, do his thing. 15 minutes for his closing statements. And you will be able to go in three, two, one. You are on, Robert. Great. Thank you. All right. So the last 15 minutes, it is the last, right? This is it? Okay. All right. So um, I'm just going to go over point by point, Rob, as much as I can to answer all the uh, uh, objections you had. Um, first of all, you said that um, it was a cop-out for me to go to the dissertation written by Horowitz to show us the origin of the flat earth uh, with a dome. Um, I don't know why you would call it a cop-out if what I gave you was factual information that this man discovered when he went into the ancient documents of the Mesopotamian cultures. Why would that be a cop-out? I would figure that you, if anybody, would want to know, uh, wow, was there another source of uh, this, this kind of uh, world uh, besides uh, what uh, I'm claiming from the Bible? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, cultures that from 3000 BC uh, were claimed to have said this, and then this guy is telling us, well, it didn't come from them. Uh, that's, that's very important information. Um, now, you talked about the Catholic Church. Um, well, you know, I, di I didn't intend for this debate to get into, you know, Catholic Church bashing. Um, I could do a lot of that myself, actually. Um, <clears throat> because the Catholic Church today is full of liberal scholars. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would say that 95% of them are, are liberal scholars especially the one you just brought up here, uh, Brother Casamagno. As a matter of fact, I debated uh, Brother Casamagno um, probably about 10 years ago on the subject of geocentrism. And um, he was a liberal Catholic that had n wanted nothing to do with it. And uh, I understand that. And uh, he speaks for the majority of Catholics today because uh, a lot of them don't know what they're talking about. I mean, this guy's talking about baptizing aliens. I mean, uh, it just shows you how far to the left or right that they have gone. So I'm in total agreement with you on that. So you don't have to point to the Bible that uh, is brought because that's all translated by Catholic liberals. Uh, and I know a lot of them that, who did the translating, okay? Uh, so if they want to put dome in there, they're just proving the point that I made earlier that they believe that the Mesopotamian cultures taught a dome with a flat earth. That's what these people were taught in seminary, in Catholic seminaries all over the world. And that's what they put in their translation. So it doesn't surprise me at all. The question is, is it correct or not? Now the way we answer that question is we go back into the history of the Catholic Church and we find out what they translated. Now here, for example, in the Douay Reims translation, which uh, was published in 1609, two years before the King James translation. As a matter of fact, the King James translation took the style from the Douay Reims Bible made in France and uh, made their Bible. So the, the two are very similar in many ways. Which, what word do they have there? Do they have the word dome? No, they have the word firmament. They have the word firmament. That was a standard English trans, or, or, um, uh, translation from the Latin, the Latin Vulgate, from momentum, okay? So nobody was using dome in traditional Catholicism. That's an innovation by the Catholic liberals who have inundated the church for the last hundred years, okay? So yeah, uh, things have changed. And now the, um, as I said, the Vulgate used firmament. How about the King James Bible, 1611? Did that use the word dome? No, use the word firmament. Okay, uh, how about the King James II Bible? Well, here's an interesting little twist. 
Many of you don't, you've never heard of the King James 2 Bible, but I have one. Uh, that uses the word expanse for the word rakia. Okay, so here we have exactly the thing I was describing before. That is, they're having difficulty in understanding how to translate this Hebrew word rakia. They, on the one hand, you have the word firm, uh, and, for, and they'll use the word firmament to describe it, and then they have the word expanse, totally on the, on the other side. It's, it's talking about something spacious, and this is the exact King James Bible. And how about the King James 2000 Bible? They switch right back to the word firmament. <laughs> All right? So here we, we have this constant variation from just three different translations of the King James Bible. All right? So uh, what is that telling us? Yeah, we have a difficulty here. All right? Uh, so, but I, just, I did want to get to this point, and oh, yeah, and remember I said before, out of 43 translations that I had uh, denoted in my book, out of that 43, there were 12 different words used for the Hebrew word rakia. Okay, everything from something really, really hard to something really, really ethereal and everything in between. And one guy said, the Lord made something on the second day because he just couldn't figure it out. Okay, yeah, so we have, we have a difficulty here and we just can't sort of fluff it off by saying, yeah, well, it's, it's going to be a dome. It's got to be a dome. No, well, that's not how we do exegesis of scripture. Okay, and, and pulling up liberal scholarship from, from Catholicism is not going to prove the point. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Rob made this comment. He said uh, something, uh, if the church makes a dogmatic comment, then I have to, or dogmatic um, decree or something, I have to believe it. And that is true, of course. But the translation that has the word dome in it is not a dogmatic decree of the Catholic Church. Okay? It's, a, it's the decree of liberals in the Catholic Church, as I pointed out. Um, so obviously they can't use the word dome there and, and think that, you know, it, it, that's the word that dropped out of the sky. No, not at all. Okay, so um, now he made a comment about uh, Augustine, and he said uh, from the scholar Nothaf that I had quoted here that Augustine had picked up the idea of the flat earth from some pagan education that he had. Well, obviously. I mean... <laughs> Augustine was a man who converted late in his life, uh, so he was inundated with pagan uh, notions from the Manichaeans that he eventually turned against when he converted and wrote against them. All kinds of silly ideas were in Augustine's head before he converted. So it, it says nothing to say that Augustine learned of the flat earth from pagan things and, 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 and that's where he got it from, so what? The question is, what does Augustine believe now that he's a converted Christian? And when we read the passages in Augustine, he talks about a spherical earth, not a flat earth. Okay, so I think that distinction is important to point out. Um, now, I'm going to go back over some of the other things that Rob had said in his um, opening remarks, because I, I think these are important. Um, he made the comment that... Um, there's a passage in Job where God asked Job, can you spread out the uh, rakia? And, he, and, and Rob was trying to say that I had reversed this because I had said that the reason the firmament could be flexible was because as a hard substance, God pounded it out, so to speak, analogously, and allowed the firmament to spread out and fill the rest of the universe. Okay, um, so I just want to clarify that that's what I had in mind, that um, yes, the firmament is a hard thing, but in order to make it flexible so that the planets and the stars can move in it, it has to be hammered out. Just like the analogy that they use in the Bible when it talks about the Rocky, it says, and then they hammered it out and made it uh, thin gold leaves. And you can even find that in the etymology of rakia, that it talks about hammering it out so it becomes thin and flexible. Well, that's exactly what God did with the firmament. He hammered it out to make it flexible. So that solves our problem of how the firmament can be hard on the one hand and flexible on the other. 
And we need that flexibility so that the birds can fly in it. Anyway, okay, so um, with Amos 9.6, Rob had talked about um, this, this, this passage being the vault of heaven, as it was translated in one translation, and he, and he pointed us out as proof that the firmament was a vault or a, a dome. Well, um, I don't know why he didn't mention this, but in my book, um, I go through the places that this Hebrew word is used. It's used in four different places. In one of those places, it's used in Exodus 12, verse 22, and it's translated this way, a bunch. And it's talking about hyssop. And he says, he held a bunch of hyssop. So that, of course, isn't a dome, is it? It's not, it's not a vault. But yet, that's the same Hebrew word that's used there. So an exegete has to take that into account when he is going to come to an understanding of what this Hebrew word agudah means. So that when he places it back into Amos 9.6, he has a fuller understanding of why this word was chosen by the author. And um, in, in the essence, basically, agudah only refers to something that's connected to something else. That's really all that it means, okay? And in the sense of the cosmos, we can see that it means that the, heaven is at the heavens are attached to the earth, all right? So it really proves nothing for anybody because in my, my universe, the earth is in the center, the heavens surround it, and the two are connected, you see. In the flat earth, it's the same thing. There's a dome that connects the, the, the dome of heaven with the flat earth, and that's all Agutha is basically saying. In other words, Agudah is just another word for the firmament, just another Hebrew synonym for that word. So you really can't get anything out of that. Um, he talked about Enoch as being, um, uh, you know, full of information about the universe. Yeah, it is. I'll admit it. But the fact is, Enoch is not an inspired book of the Bible. Uh, when the church decided on what book should be in the canon, the same canon you have today, except for seven books in the Old Testament, uh, they all decided that Enoch should not be part of it because it was just too fanciful. And there's a lot of fanciful things in Enoch, and I can see why. Now, it could have things histo of historical nature that were quoted in the book of Jude, because it says, in the book of Enoch, it says, okay? But it doesn't mean the book of Enoch was inspired. It just means that it had historical information that happened to be correct, and so he could use it. But it's not an inspired book, so you really can't make any arguments from it because it's only from the mind of man. And he talked about his uh, terrarium, and he said that um, pe people asked him, well, what does your terrarium rest on? What's its foundation? And Rob said, well, there isn't any. And, yeah, that's the only answer he can really give. There isn't any. But the Bible does, in, in Job doesn't say that... Um, God hangs the terrarium on nothing. It says God hangs the earth on nothing. Okay? We, the, if you look at Rob's picture, he's got this whole monstrosity of, a, of construction around this earth that has four corners, it has springs for pillars, it's got all kinds of things. But that's not what the, the, the passage in Job says. Okay? The passage says that the earth only is hanging on nothing. The earth only is in the center of the universe, and everything else revolves around it. Um, he talked also about Job 26, verse 10, and he says, um, I forget the exact words you used, but you said, how do you inscribe a ball into something, into space? Okay. Well, here's the problem with that, is that the word inscribe is it's not talking about inscribing a ball, okay? The, it's talking about inscribing the circle. And Rob just showed us a picture, as a matter of fact, of, of the earth when I talked about God looking above at the earth and he showed me a picture of an earth half lit. And uh, well, let's use that very picture. Uh, this is the circle, that, that line that, that separates the light from the darkness in the very picture Rob showed us is the circle that goes all the way around the earth. And we can call it a circle because it has no dimensions. There is no dimension between light and darkness in that picture. 
you see? So yeah, I can see he inscribed a circle between light and darkness. It makes perfect sense. That's how you do it in the, in the real spherical earth. Okay, so um, do you think we got anything else here? I think that'll be it. So I'll yield the rest of my time, 20 seconds, and that is it. This one. Okay, there we go. I got one, uh, one more thing I want to say. Go ahead, buddy. Um, I brought um, some copies of the principal. Uh, not many. Uh, three or four copies I've got. I also have copies of Journey to the Center of the Universe, in case anybody wants to uh, get those, because I've heard some people haven't gotten that movie, so they're available. Come and see me and uh, have your money ready. <laughs> <laughs> Please give a round of applause for... Robert Sengenis, and Rob Skiba. Now, real quick before, uh, before you guys come off of here, I have, I, I have a question about uh, the references made in the Bible about the word earth. Does the word in the Bible, when it refers to earth, does it mean the collective or does it mean the soil? It can mean both. Yeah. Uh, it depends on your context. Yeah. And, and it's pretty clear from the context. Some passages give us a little difficulty, but it's pretty clear from the context that it could be the whole earth or the land. Yeah, so erets, you have to look at the context. The when it's referring to earth, you have to dig in there as well. Yeah, and that word is used probably over a thousand times <coughs> in the Old Testament. Over and over, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I had somebody ask me that, and I thought, well, you know, it's, I kind of said the same thing you did, but there are references to where it means just the dirt, and it says earth. Okay. Well, not cool. dirt, actually. There's or another the, word for dirt. It means the, land. The ground, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please make uh, some more noise for these guys real quick. We want to say thank you again. And of course, this was a, a long time coming, and I can say this, I've seen a lot of debates, and I've seen a lot of people you know, uh, go, and, and I've seen emotions get high and, and do this, and I can honestly say, the two of you, I, I hope that you guys have a continued friendship and a continued desire to learn and study and uh, maybe do this again. I'd love to see it. <laughs> and on that note, guys, have a good evening, be safe. Tomorrow morning we start up again, and we thank you for being here, and just like I said, be very, very safe tonight. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.